Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Suzanne, the current president, for those of you that have never met me. Uh, and before I go any further, I would like to ask all of you to join me in a moment of silence. Yes. To remember the lives lost during the nation changing event that took place 20 years ago today. Those that lost their lives on September 11th, 2001, as well as all of those who have perished in conflicts that resulted from the actions on that day will always be remembered. Please join me now for that moment. Thank you all so much. Welcome to our September membership opening for 2021. <laughs> it's a pleasure to see you all. It would be a much bigger pleasure if we had been able to actually meet in person and have a conversation over coffee or brunch. I will continue to remain hopeful that before my reign as president of the league is over, I will be able to greet you all in person, especially those of you who are new and have not participated in an in-person event. Let us hope that we can get COVID under control and move forward to a more normal existence. I am so grateful for all of you who are active and engaged in some facet of league business. God knows there never seems to be an end to the issues that our membership can become involved in. Some of those areas of local concern include legislative action, environmental issues, the closure of the Pilgrim nuclear power plant and its ongoing safety, especially the safety of the communities on the Cape, the expansion of our diversity equity and inclusion education and outreach program and our ever present voter service activities. If anyone is interested in become, becoming involved in any of these areas, please feel free to contact the chairs of each of those committees or you can please feel free to contact me and I will point you in the right direction. I will list the um, chairman of the committees in the chat section, so you can check that out if you want to. In addition to items of importance on the Cape, there are a multitude of issues at the state and the national level that require our vigilance and ongoing input. As you will learn from our speaker this morning, there is much to be concerned with. Through continued education, we will learn of many ways to engage in ongoing and meaningful change. Before, our introduce, before I introduce our speaker this morning, there's a few housekeeping issues that I would like to share with you. And I will begin with a couple of announcements. If you have not had the chance to read your September voter, please do so. There's a ton of great information in there. Um, on a preventing nuclear accidents webinar will be held on September 14th. There will be two presenters, one of which is our very own voter service chair, Rosemary Shields, and the other, a member from the League of Women Voters of the Plymouth area, Henrietta Costantino. If you um, are interested in that and have not seen any notices, I believe there's one in the voter or you can contact Rosemary and she can point you in the right direction. Over the summer, a number of league members have been reading. The book discussion groups for Emmanuel Ocho's book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man will be held September, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 27th, and the 29th. We already have seven to eight people per group, 
but can have up to 10. The discussions will occur via, via Zoom. And if you are interested in participated and participating and have not already signed up, you can contact Jean Morrison or Mary Utt. Or you can make um, a note in the chat and we can get back to you. And finally, there are gonna be two virtual days having to do with voter service and legislative action in October. One is the virtual lobby day for the Votes Act, which will be on October 8th, I'm sorry, October 6th. And the other will be a virtual day on the Hill later in October, the date not yet um, established, but that will be, we will notify you of that if you're interested in participating. Both of those will take place online and um, you can contact Renata Sands or check out the October voter. I'm sure there'll be additional information then. Finally, while our speaker Jane is making her remarks, please make sure that you are muted. And if you have questions during the presentation, please put them into the chat addressed to everyone. Karen Mazza will be monitoring the chat. And after Jane is finished, Karen will call on those people who have posed questions. When you hear your name announced, please unmute yourself and ask your question. We hope to be able to address all questions. If for some reason we do not get to yours, the chat will be recorded and we can get back to you after the presentation is over. Thank you for your cooperation. And now, the current state of our democracy, what is at stake and who, if anyone can save it? There are certainly plenty of voices these days warning of the undermining of our democracy not the least of whom are our intelligence agencies, who now list domestic terrorists as a greater th threat to our security than any foreign terrorist group. How do we understand what's happening in this country? And how should we respond? Dr. Jane Scarborough is a Bachelor of Art, has a Bachelor of Arts in American history from Rice University, a Master of Arts in American Studies from Purdue University, and a Doctor of Philosophy in American Constitutional History from Rice University. After graduating from Northeastern University School of Law, Jane briefly practiced corporate and securities law at a large New York City firm before returning to NUSL as the Associate Dean of the School of Law. In 1991, she became Northeastern University's first woman vice president, where she was responsible for Northeastern Signature Cooperative Education Program. Jane returned to the law faculty in 1995 as a full-time member of the faculty teaching constitutional law, securities law, gender, sexuality, and the law, and legal ethics, which some say is an oxymoron. Since retiring in 2002, Jane has taught dozens of courses in constitutional history and law to senior citizens in recent years under the auspices of the Mashpee Public Library. That's quite the intro, Jane. Um, and we are definitely waiting with bated breath to hear how you're gonna help us solve what's going on in our country. Welcome, Jane. Thank you. As Suzanne said, it was suggested that I talk with you this morning about the state of our democracy in 30 minutes. Uh, <laughs> How do we make sense of what is happening today, even if I was given hours to talk with you about it? We are facing so many critical issues that labeling something an existential threat is becoming cliched. How did we get to this place? 
America is becoming unrecognizable to many of us. My spouse, who is a clinical psychologist, describes what the country is going through as a psychotic episode. When I asked her to explain that, she says, well, the very definition of psychosis is when one can't distinguish between reality and fantasy. And she adds, when the fantasy leads a person to be a danger to herself or others, we used to hospitalize them. Well, I didn't think that was such a promising basis for our discussion this morning, even though that diagnosis did have a ring of truth about it. With further reflection on the topic, the state of our democracy, for me, it morphed into the state of our union. As I thought about the constitutionally mandated presidential address each year to Congress, which hasn't always been presented in person, but certainly has since the advent of television. Somewhere in the first paragraphs of such an address, you will inevitably find a sentence that includes the words, the state of our union is blank, fill in the blank. So with a willing suspension of disbelief, I imagined myself writing such an address. How would I end that sentence? The state of our union is. Probably not with the word strong, which has been the most common descriptor in recent presidential addresses. Having rejected some of the more obvious words these days to complete that sentence, I rejected, for example, the state of our union is toast. I realized there was really only one way to complete that statement. The state of our union is in the hands of the people where I might add, it has always been. Not only do I believe that is the only answer to describe the current state of our union, but also the answer to the most serious threat to our democracy since the Civil War. The answer to that threat is also in the hands of the people. This past winter, I taught a course entitled Democracy in America. We began by reading excerpts from Alexis de Tocqueville's classic four volume account of his 1831 visit to America. The historian Daniel Borston writing the introduction to the classics edition of the book said that quote, although Tocqueville writes about a nation and a continent, his overwhelming concern is for the individual. According to Borston, Quote, Tocqueville was a prophet, even inventor of individualism. The very word individualism first entered the English language, according to Borston, through Henry Reeves' first translation of Democracy in America in 1838. But if, as Borston claims, Tocqueville invented individualism, he wasn't always a fan of it. In his second volume, of democracy in America, which is rarely read by Americans, Tocqueville's theme is what he labels democratic individualism, a term by which he means an appropriate individualism protected and encouraged within the framework of a strong government. But in other circumstances, Tocqueville warns that individualism can become excessive in that case, he feared that individualism taken to an extreme could become one of the most dangerous aspects of American democracy. Tocqueville argues that by eroding social and political bonds between people, excessive individualism can lead to a materialistic society of single-minded people striving toward wealth rather than the common good. Unfortunately, we are currently seeing an example of Tocqueville's concern about excessive individualism playing out in the refusal of some people to get vaccinated against COVID-19. They do so in the name of their freedom. For these people, the national priority of reaching herd immunity for the health of the country is subordinate to the idea that in a free country, 
Government can't mandate an individual to do something they don't choose to do, even if it affects the health of their own children, family, and neighbors. As much as Tocqueville viewed individualism as a double-edged sword, he was an enthusiastic believer in democracy, as only a convert can be. He liked the traditions of local democracy, what he called the township institutions, quote, that give the people the taste for freedom and the art of being free. Despite the vast empty spaces of their country, Americans, Tocqueville wrote, met one another, made decisions together, carried out projects together. Americans were good at democracy then because they practiced democracy. Americans were good at democracy because he said they practiced democracy. We no longer practice democracy enough. Under the constitution, it is we the people who are responsible for forming the government and to whom the government is answerable at the ballot box, which of course is why I finished the sentence with the state of our union is in the hands of the people. But our track record for holding the government accountable is abysmal with voter turnout even in presidential election years, barely more than 50%. We've turned over the practice of democracy to the professional politicians who have turned over the practice to the highest bidder. Tocqueville's observation that in our young democracy, Americans were good at democracy because they practiced democracy offers one explanation for how we've lost our way. The organizations and associations that Tocqueville recognized as the incubators of dem democratic habits and practices for the most part no longer exist. The League of Women Voters is the exception, but most religious and fraternal organizations are skeletons of their former selves, if they are even still in existence. Instead, individuals form groups instantly with like-minded people online and participate and participation is measured by the number of friends or likes one has on Facebook. In a fascinating new book entitled Dem Democracy Rules, Princeton's poli-sci philosopher Jean Werner Muller offers a way of reconciling individualism and freedom. Muller encourages us to see uncertainty, including the possibility that an incumbent may lose as essential to any truly democratic system. Preserving uncertainty, he writes, means that democracy is inherently dynamic and fluid. On the one hand, individuals remain at liberty to decide what matters to them most. But at the same time, our commitment to a civil society in a democratic country means that freedom has to be contained by what he describes as two hard borders. Others have referred to those borders as the guardrails of our democracy, or as one writer has recently called it, the narrow corridor, referring to the narrow space in which liberty connects a vibrant society with an effective responsive state. What are Mueller's two hard borders? First and foremost is the non-negotiable claim that government cannot deny the free and equal standing of its citizens with equal access to the ballot, the most basic indicia of democracy. Secondly, people cannot refuse to be, quote, constrained by what we can plausibly call facts, end quote. In other words, the hard borders or guardrails of our democracy are equal access, to the equal access to the ballot box and shared responsibility and understanding of and commitment to the outcomes based on discernible facts. Mueller, who says that democracy is, quote, based on the notion that no one is politically irredeemable, 
and that anyone can change their mind calls out the possibility of persuasion. But as one of his reviewers writes, quote, this notion is what makes democracy such an appealing idea in theory, but hard to sustain in practice, especially if there's a motivated cohort that doesn't care about Mueller's hard border of facts. Enter the Republican Party under Trump, where the leadership, including the then president, doesn't recognize or adhere to those hard borders when they in fact violate both the constitutional principles as well as the norms that flow from those principles, the so-called guardrails of our democracy. What happens to a democracy when then president, then president and several members of Congress plan and initiate an insurrection to stop Congress from doing its constitutional duty to read the results of the electoral college certifying the winner of the presidential election. Just hours after congressmen and women had to hide and be protected from the angry mob on January 6th, bent on stopping the certification of Joe Biden as the winner of the presidency, 147 Republicans voted to overturn the electoral college results notwithstanding a broad coalition of top government officials who had declared the 2020 presidential election, quote, the most secure election in American history. In a democracy, there is always a struggle for power between the people and the government. Consider what is happening now in several of the Southern states over who has the power to mandate the wearing of face masks by children returning to school can a governor determine what will or will not be permitted in schools? But today's struggle for power is different and imminently more dangerous to democracy. Historian and author Anne Applebaum describes our current situation as a quote, nightmarish inversion of the Tocquevillian dream, a new sort of wilderness and in this new wilderness, democracy is becoming impossible where one half of the country can't hear the other. Americans can no longer have shared institutions, apolitical courts, a professional civil service, or a bipartisan foreign policy. We can't compromise. We can't make collective decisions. We can't even agree on what we're deciding. We are no longer the America Tocqueville admired, but have become the enfeebled democracy, a place wherein, as he described it, each person is, quote, withdrawn and apart, is like a stranger to the destiny of all the others. His children and his particular friends form the whole species for him. As for dwelling with his fellow citizens, he is beside them, but he does not see them. He touches them and does not feel them. He exists only in himself and for himself alone." End quote. It has now been eight months since the insurrection and attack on the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. But according to Harvard professor Daniel Ziblock, who is the co-author of How Democracies Die, the level of anxiety is actually higher now than in the immediate aftermath of the insurrection, perhaps in part because it's no longer just about one person. But as Ziblock says, quote, there are broader structural issues stemming from a much deeper level of misinformation and conspiracy theories than the former presidents alone. Trump tried everything he could to overthrow the Democratic vote in the presidential election of 2020, first through the courts, then through the Department of Justice, and finally through his supporters at the state level. 
Now those supporters are maneuvering to serve as election officials in swing states in what can only be described as a coordinated onslaught on voting rights and election results. Under the constitution, the electoral votes are certified at the state level and then sent to Congress, which has only the ministerial duty to read the state results, formally certifying the winner of the presidency. It only has the ministerial duty to read the results. There, it may have a greater duty if there's a tie and it has to come to the house. But as far as what comes in from the states, that is where the decisions are made. As a result, the most worrying threat is at the state level where Republican-led legislatures are changing the voting rules so that the authority of the secretaries of state in the process of certifying a state's election results is passed on to an election committee chosen by the state legislature, which theoretically could cast the electoral votes for the candidate of their choice, effectively nullifying the state's citizens. Remember, it was only the integrity and courage of some Republican secretaries of state that were the crucial bulwarks against Trump's attempted coup. Under the changes to the election procedures now being enacted across a number of states, what Trump attempted to do illegally could now be done legally. The Republicans are also launching a nationwide assault on voting rights, making it harder for college age students and people of color in particular to get convenient access to the ballot to vote. Two cohorts, surprise, surprise, who tend to vote democratic. But the real surprise is that all of this is being done out in the open in plain sight including the Republicans' acknowledgement that because of the changing demographics, they can't win elections without somehow cooking the books through voter suppression, gerrymandering voting districts, and changing who certifies election results at the state level if all else fails. The founders imagined the court would, re would be the founders imagined, excuse me, the courts would be responsible for, uh, for protecting and encouraging the civil liberties basic to democracy. And there's none more basic than the right to vote and have your vote counted. Unfortunately, led by Chief Justice John Roberts, the Supreme Court has shown repeatedly that it cannot be counted on to stop this all out support on voting rights. Long before he became Chief Justice, John Roberts was already on record opposing any extension of the Voting Rights Act. First as a clerk to Supreme Court Justice William Rehnquist, and then as an influential aide in Ronald Reagan's Justice Department. During Roberts' confirmation hearings in the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Ted Kennedy questioned Roberts on his views of the, right, of the Voting Rights Act <clears throat> and its extension, to which Roberts responded, quote, the Voting Rights Act's constitutionality has been upheld and I don't have any issue with that, end quote. But once on the court, Chief Justice Roberts did indeed take issue with the extension of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 once considered the crown jewel of the civil rights movement. The first serious blow to voting rights came in the 2013 Shelby County versus Holder decision in which Chief Justice Roberts writing for the five four majority gutted section five of the Voting Rights Act. Section five, as the pre-clearance section is the pre is known as the pre-clearance section because it required those counties and states with a history of suppressing minority voting to seek approval 
by the Department of Justice or by a federal judge before any changes to voting requirements or election logistics could be enacted. The expiration date of Section 5 had been reauthorized by Congress four different times, but most recently in 2006, when it was extended for 25 more years by an overwhelming vote in the House and a unanimous vote in the Senate. Despite that legislative endorsement, only seven years later, Chief Justice Roberts effectively wrote Section 5 and preclearance out of the act, leaving only Section 2 as a tool to fight election practices and procedures that discriminate on the basis of, of race. Section two prohibits any voting law or practice which results in a denial of abridgment of the right of any citizen to vote on account of color. It's important to understand the difference between the section five remedy and the section two remedy. Section five with its preclearance prevented discrimination before it could become operative. Section two involves after the fact litigation when the illegal scheme has been put in place and individuals have been already elected pursuant to it. Within hours of the announcement of the Shelby decision, Southern states began enacting the very changes to voting procedures and requirements that had been denied them under the preclearance process. Although technically it was still unconstitutional to draw <clears throat> voting districts that discriminate on the basis of race, by a 5-4 decision in 2019, Chief Justice Roberts, again writing for the majority, said that partisan gerrymandering claims present, quote, political questions beyond the reach of the federal courts. It's an ironic position for Chief Justice, since Roberts was part of the legal team that went to Florida to advocate for George Bush, culminating in the Supreme Court's decision in Bush v. Gore. That was not beyond the reach of the federal courts. Thus, prior to the most recent Supreme Court decision with respect to voting rights, which was this last term, the court had already done away with Section 5 preclearance, which had been enormously effective and had refused to adjudicate partisan gerrymandering. The preclearance section was so effective in her dissent, the late Justice Ginsburg said that doing away with, channel, with Section 5 was like throwing away your umbrella because you weren't getting wet in a rainstorm. So all that was left of the historic achievements of the civil rights movement in the 60s was Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which allowed states and counties to be sued whose voting procedures violated Section 2 and the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Which brings us to the most recent decision on the part of the court with respect to voting rights. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, at least 400 restrictive bills have been introduced in 40 states. And as of July, 18 states have enacted 30 of those bills into laws, restricting access to the vote in a variety of ways. Arizona was one such state. In response to these sweeping changes being made to state election laws, the Democratic National Committee sued Arizona's Attorney General Mark Burnovich under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act in what was considered a crucial test for what remained of the voting rights goal to protect access to the ballot for people of color and to enforce the 15th Amendment. At issue in the Brnovich case were two kinds of voting restrictions passed by Arizona's legislature. One required election officials to discard ballots cast at the wrong precinct rather than marking them provisional 
and then when the voters eligibility was confirmed, counting the ballot. The other challenge measure made it a crime for campaign workers, community activists, and others to collect ballots for delivery to the polling places, a practice called ballot harvesting. The Democratic National Committee lost at the trial level, but the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals found both Arizona policies resulted in discrimination and furthermore, that the ballot collection prohibition was passed for a racially discriminatory purpose. There was an interesting exchange between Justice Amy Coney Barrett and the Republican National Committee's attorney during oral argument. She asked, why is the RNC in this case? What is their interest in this case? His answer was perhaps more candid than he intended. Here was his answer, quote, without these new rules, we're at an unrealistic disadvantage relative to Democrats. Politics is a zero sum game and every extra vote they get through unlawful interpretation of section two hurts us. End of quote. Wasn't about election integrity, wasn't about election fraud, it was about not being able to win elections. While the Chief Justice had written the opinions in the Shelby case and in the partisan gerrymandering case, he assigned the Brnovich decision to Justice Alito, who at this point has surpassed Justice Thomas, in my view, as the most conservative member of the court. Justice Alito's opinion for the 6-3 majority reads like it was written by the RNC. Alito devises a series of factors to guide lower courts, all of which, as one commentator put it, are tools to be utilized to throw challengers out of court. Here are some of the factors that the court gives the lower courts for guidance in these matters. If a law simply imposes what Alito calls the usual burdens of voting, it cannot be challenged. If a law conforms to standard practices existing in 1982, it most likely cannot be challenged. If a voting rule imposes only small disparities for voters of color, it cannot be challenged. So it's the size of how it affects people of color, not the fact it affects them. If a voting rule challenged as discriminatory is offset by other voting opportunities, it cannot be challenged. More importantly, if a voting rule serves legitimate government interests, it most likely cannot be challenged. Ignoring the long history of fraud as a pretext for racial discrimination, Justice Alito writing for the six person majority calls the prevention of election fraud, quote, a strong and entirely legitimate government purpose for these changes, end quote. Most distressing is the fact that Alito and the majority seem to be inured to the law lies about voter fraud in the election of 2020, which were the real cause that undermined the legitimacy of the vote. And instead, the decision embraced the language of Trump and the Republicans as if all of these new election measures were needed and legitimate to address problems within the 2020 election. The year 2021 marks the 151st anniversary of the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which makes racial discrimination in voting unconstitutional. And yet protecting the voting rights of non-white citizens as promised in that amendment has been one of our country's most persistent problems. Over those years, the Supreme Court has been an enabler in this process, not an enforcer of the amendment. An enabler by slicing and dicing words and text, allowing states to continue this disgraceful 150 year history of racial discrimination. On his Sunday program, GPS, which is one program I almost never miss, 
if you don't know of it, it's on at not, it's on at 10 o'clock on Sundays on CNN and it's repeated at one o'clock. Fareed Zakaria recently discussed how for a liberal democratic society to maintain itself, it needs a government strong enough to provide for the common good while simultaneously allowing individuals the freedom to exercise their civil rights. This was Tocqueville's formula for a society based on democratic individualism. And implicitly, it includes Mueller's concept of hard borders. In other words, maintaining a liberal democracy is no secret. We know what is required. We must simply reclaim the fundamental democratic principles and values this nation was founded on. But how do we do that? Only at the ballot box. Thank you. I think I'll stop there and open it up for Q&A to the floor. Oh my God. <laughs> I think we should have another moment of silence. Yeah. Uh, Karen, how are you doing with the Q&A? Well, we have a number of questions here. Some of you have written several questions, and I think the fair thing to do would be to ask you to read your first question, and I will then go on to somebody else. And when your second question comes up, I'll call you then as opposed to have you read all of your questions at one time. So, um, um, and if there's a question that's off uh, to a different topic, I'm gonna save that for later. So Debbie, I'm gonna save your question for a little bit later. Um, Suzanne, you've got the first question here. Okay. And I have to apologize because I, I typed in a lot of questions as I was listening. So, um, so my first question is, while the fate of America is in the hands of the people, they elect representatives. When those representatives do not act as those who elected them think they should, how does democracy go forward? You vote the rascals out of office. That's right. I don't know, and you know, I don't know right. another cure for that. That's, right. That's the reason it is so important. And I'm talking, I know, to the choir, but it is so important. Yes. We have to get as many people as possible registered, and we have to get all of them and us to the elections to vote. There you go. I don't have a more, I don't have a fuller answer, Suzanne, to your question than that. I think that is the answer. It, it, have we ever thought about a recall issue? The constitution doesn't, uh, doesn't contemplate recall. It contemplates impeachment. Okay. And oh. the Senate didn't do what all of us knew it needed to do twice. It was even more so the second time, an attempted coup. So the founders answer was the impeachment process. And um, it just didn't, uh, the Senate didn't do its job. The Senate, again, voted in a partisan way to retain power under their president. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Florence, do you wanna ask your first question? Uh, you know what, Karen, I can seem to find it. Suddenly I've lost that chat room. You want me to read it for you? Sure, please. Our union is in the hands of the people, but what happens when one party is tying those hands by suppressing the vote of a large part of the electorate? Well, that's what she just said you just it's is that from Florence yes yes uh, Florence it the party leadership 
that again, I want to apologize for just using the general uh, name, the Republican Party. I know there are Republicans who don't agree and aren't doing this, going along with this, but the leadership of the Republican Party and all of those that are following them, um, again, I don't know how you stop this except to vote them out. Um, we have watched Mitch McConnell virtually make the Senate, the only business the Senate did when they were in the majority was confirm judges. Right. Nothing else got to the floor. Um, but yet he was, re but Jane, he was reelected. Yes, he was. <laughs> but despite everyone's efforts. So, well, again, here's where I am so critical of the court because Citizens United yes. um, and they're doing away with the, some of the measures, the election measures uh, um, to get dark money out of elections has not been successful because the court has virtually made that, has legitimized it, has sanctioned, given it its sanction to do that. The money in the politics, one of the reasons, in my opinion, that Mitch McConnell won anyway, is that he has so much money behind him. And um, all of the efforts, the legitimate efforts to try to vote someone else in, that makes them very difficult. The gerrymandering makes it very difficult. And the court again has said, we're not going to touch that. You go ahead. So it, when I, I understand how simplistic and superficial it may sound when I say the only answer is really to vote them out because that is the only answer I see. And um, the other answer would be to have the court revisit some of its uh, shameless decisions, but that's not going to happen. Certainly not with the current court um, for decades, maybe. Uh, so we don't have a, a lot of tools in our toolbox, Florence, except what you all do, which is the ballot. Get people out to vote. But even with those number, I don't want to pursue this, but even with numbers that went up, uh, they're all being challenged. I mean, look at Georgia where you had uh, such an increase in the black vote, black and Latina vote, people of color. And, but yet it's being challenged and it, now they've done everything in Georgia to repress those votes. We're going back to Jim Crow days. Well, there's certainly a lot that feels that way, um, you know, but what Stacey Abrams did in Georgia and what Fair Vote is doing across the country is what we have to do. What the Republicans, and again, I'm using that as if all of them think about it the same way, which obviously isn't true, but the Republicans see what's coming. They see that white people aren't gonna be a majority and white people are their base and they've made no effort by policies to attract a broader base. In fact, they've done the opposite. They've taken the decision that we are gonna have fewer voters, but we're gonna keep those other voters from being able to vote. In fact, one of the, Republican, one of the Republicans in Congress the other day said, when he thought the mic wasn't on, that it's not the number of voters that count, it's the quality of the voters. Ah, the quality that look like me, the white voters, they're the quality voters and they're the ones we want to vote. They're the ones the founders were counting on and we're disappearing. So we have to do something or we will never win. Go back to sleep, game. honey. I'm listening to the lecture. Uh, okay. <laughs> any rate, um, that's... Uh, I sound like I'm repeating myself, but 
I don't know anything else other than doing that. And I think that, again, the numbers are on our side, our, our side, the democracy side, to somehow get to where we have two legitimate parties. You need two parties for a democratic system, at least. Are you okay? Do you mind if I listen to um, If you're having a private conversation, you should mute. Okay. Karen, how are we doing? Okay, a uh, quick question from Susan Quinones. And after Susan, I'm going to go to Carol Young Kleinfeld. Susan, Susan, where are you? I'm looking for Susan. Wave your there, hand. I just unmuted. Oh, um, I, I just wanted, you mentioned democracy rules and you mentioned the author. And I was just wondering if you could just repeat that name again. The name is Jean, J A N. Middle name or second name is Werner, V E R N E R, Muller, M U L L E R. E R. Okay, thank you. The Princeton uh, philosopher, very well known. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Carol. Carol hi, hi, Jane. Thank you. Um, would you comment um, on the future success of the um, national popular vote interstate compact that awards electoral votes to the winner of the presidential popular vote? Good question. Um, the national popular vote compact is something that really came up, was thought up by uh, Akhil Amar, who is a professor of law at Yale. Yeah. He and his brother, actually, who is also a law professor. Um, and the idea is it will take a constitutional amendment to eliminate the Electoral College. So they came up with a way that you could keep the Electoral College, but create a national vote so that that would determine the presidency. So they created this compact and states join the compact by their legislature agreeing to it and their governor signing that agreement. And the compact, the promise is this, that you will award when the, this goes into effect when they have enough members for the 272 votes, which is what it takes to be elected. Oops. When they have that number of electoral votes, the states that have joined on, their electoral votes add up to that, then it goes into play and they, these states have promised that they will award their electoral votes to the national winner, not the state winner, but to the national winner, so mm -hmm. that you, if you get enough states under the compact, you will then get a way of declaring a national vote as the way a president is chosen but still have the electoral college structure with, so you won't have to address the changing of the constitution. Um, I haven't looked recently. Last time I looked, I think they had 14 states and, and District of Columbia, and they have something like, I don't know, 172 electoral votes maybe. Um, and there were several states, I think, uh, thinking like New Mexico and Arizona, that era, that were contemplating joining it. The catch is so far, guess what? The only states that have joined it are blue states, are mm -hmm. democratic states. Once again, the Republicans, by, by God, they don't want a national winner because a national winner, um, they haven't had a national winner since maybe Lincoln, I don't know, he wasn't even actually. Yeah. Um, so that's the compact. I don't know if it, it, it's a little complicated, but I think if you get the idea is to get enough states to say, yeah, we think the national vote should determine the presidency. So we will commit to doing that once this compact has enough states that can make that the winner, we'll all kick in, kick in and do it. The states have the right to bow out, but not at the last minute before really they know, they may have a fear that they see somebody coming up as the national, uh, that's gonna win the national vote that they don't uh, want to vote for. 
but they can only do that mm -hmm. again before the results are known. Mm -hmm. um, that's, the, that's the idea and that's what's in existence and they are continuing to try to get other states to join if some of the purple states become bluer and they join, they could, they, you know, they're on their yeah. way. I think they have somewhere between, well, I think they have about not quite two thirds of what they need. So it's pretty good. So that's, Carol, maybe that's too many. I'm not sure. No, no, um, you're, you're right. The last article I saw was they have 72% of the votes they need to reach 270. So. Right. That's pretty, that's encouraging. It is encouraging. <laughs> and again, it's one thing that could get us out from under the Electoral College. Because the yeah. problem with the Electoral College is it so overrepresents the states that are small. I mean, a state like right. Wyoming, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, every person that lives in Wyoming, and I'm making up the numbers, but you'll get the idea, every person that lives in Wyoming uh, is vote represents maybe 400, 4,000 and some odd, and every person in California represents 400 and some odd right. because yeah. the vote is so weighted. Right. The, the two right. senatorial votes, I mean, every vote, every state has at least three, the two senators and one representative, mm -hmm. but it really overstates the difference in those smaller states versus the large states. Yeah. And Thank the you. College may have had a purpose at the time the Constitution was written, but it's yeah. far, okay. we've left it by far. And um, a constitutional amendment, I can't imagine, would ever get through um, yeah. Yeah. The, the various steps. Um, and again, the founders made it, uh, mindfully made it difficult to amend the Constitution. We only have 27 amendments over all these years, and the first 12 were proposed in the first Congress. Um, so it hasn't been amended that often. Um, I'm hoping that somehow the, the women's equal rights might eventually get through, but unclear. Um, so, Carol. Okay, thank you. Good question, thank you. Uh, Judy, you have a question that builds on Florence's and also as uh, an extension of this discussion about the national popular vote. Do you want to ask your question? Yes. Hi, Judy. Uh, I recently got uh, an appeal from Common Cause and the whole appeal dealt with the national popular vote. And years ago, I used to contribute regularly to Common Cause, and then they became one of these organizations where every month I got an appeal and I resented the amount of postage they were wasting. And I tried, I'm going to give once a year, don't send me any more letters. And that didn't work. So I stopped giving. But I'm wondering with, you know, and I've never felt that Common Cause really was all that successful. But it, so I'm wondering what your opinion is. And should I try it again with Common Cause and deal with my irritation? <laughs> well, I personally think you had the right solution. Give to them once, which supports what they're doing. But, you know, you can do that without giving every time they ask you in an appeal. And I think you're probably going to, it, it, I have found it impossible almost to, once you've given, to stop the solicitations. I get over a hundred emails every day from all different people of the party and that are running all over the country. I can't even find the ones that I want. Uh, I miss some of them because they're buried in all of these solicitations. So I have decided, and my spouse and I have decided that we are, there are only a few things that we think are really critical that we're supporting. And uh, one of them is the, solicitations for support in the states for the national popular vote. That is one of them. The other is Stacey Abrams group because what they're doing all over the country is what she did in Georgia. And it's registering people who haven't voted. It's soliciting their vote. It is, I think, yeah. the most singular 
uh, democratic effort, and that's with a small d mm -hmm. that's going on right now. So we've decided to limit ourselves. There's just too many, and all of them are good and important, but most of us don't have the money to give, make any significant difference unless we really limit it. So just to follow up though, your opinion of common cause and its effectiveness? I think common cause has been effective over the years. I think they were more effective when the causes were more clear and singular than now when, as I say, there are so many issues that it's hard. I think it's been hard for common cause to not be kind of diluted in their efforts. And then they seem to be less effective. But I think it's been a very good organization and I have supported it in the past. Um, I, I think again, um, it's, it's just become so hard for them to have an impact because again, they are, uh, they're spread so thin. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jean Morrison. Where's Jean? There she is. Hi, Jean. I'm here. Hi, Jean. You want to ask Hi. My long question? <laughs> yeah, that, well, whatever question you want to ask. <laughs> I, I just have to find it. It is kind of a long <laughs> question. So I really appreciate your comments about race. And it was uh, interjected into the discussion of what some of the key problems and challenges are and of voting. And, you know, I'm concerned and a little confused about how to make progress unless we look at the targets of the voter suppression. Uh, we need to ask ourselves, why is this allowed? Especially as it's done out in the open. Right. So I think there is some, there's a key factor that we're skirting a little bit and I'm just putting this straight out there. It seems that the most vulnerable and marginalized people are used at either end of the political spectrum, either to obtain votes or to suppress votes, rather than us focusing on the inclusion of the voices that will foster the democratic individualism that you talked about, or, or empowering this democracy, especially if we're going moving towards uh, majority minority. The, to me, that seems to be the issue. So my question really is, are the efforts of social and racial justice advocacy groups, you mentioned Stacey Abrams, who is that, but also connected to voting, um, striving and striving for the equal rights uh, at the ballot and highlighting the outcomes based on facts. Are those efforts worthy and necessary for the change that we need? The efforts, I'm a little unclear as to whose efforts you talked about a lot, but are you mean, are you saying groups like what Stacey Abrams and others are doing, are those efforts necessary and not, not, not just focused on the vote groups specifically striving for social and racial justice change like groups like the NAACP, right, the ADL the ACLU, all those extra groups and the local groups that are trying to make change within our society to empower the very people that we know are being suppressed. So to address systemic racism and other social systemic issues because the poor are also under attack. Absolutely. Attacking the issues of systemic racism in this country, um, we have to get past all of the patting some of ourselves on the back for what we've done and understand what we haven't done and understand what we don't understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I highly recommend the book Cast, that's C-A-S-T-E, by the woman who did the migration uh, under Wilkinson. Wilkerson. Yes, thank you. Wilkerson. Isabel, I think. Isabella. Isabel Wilkerson. You is in that book I learned so much. And I think, hey, you know, I I'm there. I understand things. We don't. 
And we have to recognize that and start listening to those people who are under the radar, who are not represented. I mean, that's one of the ways Trump won his presidency. He won it because a lot of those people that voted for him didn't really know they were voting for some of what came. What they were voting is their anger, the fact that the system doesn't work for them. And some of us for whom the system does work have to find out why that is and begin to put our efforts behind changing that. And that's what makes it hard because changing that means sharing the power. You have to be honest, it means sharing the power. And power is something again that neither party wants to really give up. The question is to what ends will they go to keep it? And one of the major parties has shown that they will go to any ends to keep it. Karen, can I ask a follow-up question? It's Florence. Uh, I, Jean, there's so many okay. pieces. Your question is so uh, central to the problem. Right. Um, we have to start, we white people, not just white people, but people for whom the system is working have to start listening and quit talking. Karen, can I ask a follow-up question? Sure, go ahead. Um, you use the comment, and many people do, the system, the people who voted for Trump, the system wasn't working for them. Jane, there were many wealthy people who voted for Trump. The right. system was, it wasn't that the system wasn't working. People were afraid that they would lose the power. Right. Those are the people who voted. I mean, other people did also, but I mean, those were the people who voted for Trump because they feared the loss of power. They had it. They didn't want to give it up to people of color, to poor people. And so I think it's wrong to say the system wasn't working for them. The system was working well for them and they wanted to make sure they kept that control. That's how I feel about it anyway. Well, there was certainly that element. There's no question about it. And that was the element of big dark money that was behind him. That was the element that Bannon represented in terms of saying, you know, Trump's candidacy ended up being to take down the system, to take down the institutions. And yes, the very wealthy knew that when taking that, those systems down, it was going to benefit them. And you're right, that was a whole group. But I don't think that was the majority group. It may have been the majority group of money that supported the presidency of Trump. But in terms of numbers, there were just all of these people who thought he was a man who made it. A good businessman. We asked our plumber why he why he was a Trump supporter, and he said, "Well, and he has his own little business." He said, "Well, he's a good businessman, and that's what I am, and that's what I think the country needed." Well, he wasn't a good businessman. No, but that was just part of the lies, part of the the script. Um, and I think that the pe people wanted to turn the thing upside down because, again it wasn't working for them. Uh, so I still think that's a huge component, not the big, biggest money component, but the biggest numbers in terms of the base. And some of those have, you know, had buyer's remorse, but a lot of them haven't. They're still angry. And they have I make had so much misinformation. Um, and it isn't just the uneducated, I mean, we have friends, we have family members who are educated, who, you know, aren't going to be vaccinated because vaccines kill people. You're kidding me. I mean, and, you know, those 600,000 that were reported, they weren't just killed by COVID. They were killed by all kinds of other things. We can't trust what the government tells us about anything. That's why this is so dangerous, because it is so anti government. Mm. It's not just small government, it's anti-government. And you can't have a democracy the size of this country with the multiplicity of interests 
without a strong national government that only is the only the only governmental unit that can attack certain problems that we have now. Do you have any hope for, hope for the Voting Rights Act? Florence, well, there I are other people who have asked quit need to ask their questions too. <laughs> okay, sorry. I just want to go back to Jean for a minute to make sure that again, we could talk forever about it, trying to answer your question, but I want to make sure that I at least touched on what you want, what you were asking. If not, please ask it again. <laughs> no, yes, you did. Thank you. And I think I was intentional on having a question that could go on and on just to get all of us to think um, more so, broadly about some of the systemic issues. So thank you for your comments. I appreciate okay. it. Karen? Um, I, there are three people, uh, Suzanne, Rosemary, and Anita, who have all asked a question about the Supreme Court. Uh, I'll let Suzanne read uh, her version of that question. You want me to read it for you? Okay. Yeah. Uh, if, if the Supreme Court is not supposed to be partisan, but apparently is, how can that be rectified? Well, you know, there, the President Biden did create a commission to study the Supreme Court to think about what reforms maybe are needed. And they're looking at things like adding members, adding more members to the court to try to balance out uh, ideologies. Um, I don't think that's going to go anywhere, although it's certainly, it's not that it's unconstitutional. I mean, the, the court has been various sizes, but it has unfortunately the kind of FDR court packing concept with it that is hard to get people passed. And it just seems like, you know, we don't like them, we're going to add our own. Uh, and again, that's counter to the issue of a nonpartisan court. I think the good news about Chief Justice Roberts, I gave you the bad news, uh, is that he is concerned about the courts being viewed as partisan. And it is his court, it's his <laughs> legacy. And he's going to be there. He's a young man still for the by court standards. Um, so he is concerned about that. And you see him parting from the conservatives in those ways. The problem is there's still five very, very strong conservatives without the chief justice. But he, for example, in the most recent, I think unbelievable action by the Supreme Court in that, uh, that order about whether or not to allow the Texas abortion law to go into effect, he sided with the liberals on that. It was a 5-4 case, even though it wasn't a case, it was an order. There was no briefing. Uh, you have no explanations from any of those who, the five that said, we should let it go into effect. When the Supreme Court decides in the shadow docket, which maybe I'll talk about in a minute, that a law, a state law, which is clearly unconstitutional under the court's own precedence at the moment, that they allow that to go into effect. It's lawless. It's like the court has now become lawless like all the other branches, or at least the Congress. Very, very distressing. Mm -hmm. And so he is very concerned about it. But again, now he's only now he's you know, just he's only four with when he joins the uh, three liberal justices and you still have five others that tend to be pretty ideologically driven. There's a lot that we still don't know about Justice Amy Coney Barrett. We know and she has at least in her first term been very cautious she was part of the six to three on the voting rights, the Arizona voting rights decision. Um, but 
she still could be not as um, not as dogma driven as people assume she is. The one thing that I can tell you that this current court, when I talk to the Snow Library in a few weeks, that this court is very much reducing the wall between state and religion. This court is very much favorable, uh, favoring religious exemptions for all of the discrimination laws. Even recently, the court uh, agreed to postpone the execution of a Texas man because he wanted his pastor to be allowed to be in the room and touching him and praying while he was being executed. They agreed to postpone that execution and they've actually set it up to be argued in this term. But there's been a whole series of cases before that where they have allowed a pastor to be there then there was a question of a Muslim wasn't allowed. Then there was a question of a Buddhist. It, it, they've been all over the place, but what is clear is that the court is uh, favorable to the religious, the first amendment, freedom to express, freedom to practice your religion. This is a court that, uh, has its thumb on that scale, that side of the scale. And that I think is gonna continue. And we have several cases coming up in the next, in this term that's gonna start in a few, in a week or so. Um, well, it's more than a week, but it's October, first Monday in October. Um, any rate, sorry, I kind of got, I can get off on my, Okay. On my tangents, I've been known to do that, right, Paula? <laughs> I'd like to move to uh, Debbie Winnick. Uh, Debbie, you've got two questions. Ask your question first about the Snow Library, and then we could talk about the other question on the march. All right, so my first question is, um, when are you speaking at the Snow Library? I can't find it on their website. It's um, they usually put out a brochure, which I haven't gotten a copy of yet. So I don't know if they put it out uh, or not. It's, uh, it is September 29th. It's at 1030. And you can register through the library. And as I say, the first 40 who want it, I think, are going to be in the room and everybody else is going to be on Zoom. But it's uh, in the morning, as this was, at 1030. Um, and I'm speaking on the summary of the big cases in this last term, which includes the one we've talked about today, uh, and then spend a little more time specifically on a preview of why the commentators are already saying this is going to be the most consequential term of the Supreme Court in decades because of the cases that are before it. There are abortion cases, there's gun right cases. Um, it's gonna be, um, they're anticipating they're gonna be some very consequential decisions coming down, so. Thank you very much. So I live in Orleans, I haven't seen anything about it either, so. I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a secret. I think, I think it's a secret. A secret. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My second question, can I go for the second one? Yes, go ahead. Go for it. My second question is whether or not, the, I'm a brand new member of the Cape Cod League. Um, I came from Needham. Um, so my question is, is the league planning anything for October 2nd, which is the um, March for Women, the National March for Women? I can't answer that. Uh, Suzanne? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Suzanne, you got muted again. Unmute. Um, Debbie, we have a board meeting on Tuesday and we're going to take that up. But I would suppose, um, given um, what's going on in the world, that that would probably take place. But we will let you know right after the board meeting. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, have people that want to talk? Um, 
Well, let me jump in here for a second. It is just about noon. I know that there are other questions and I want to um, get a sense of the um, audience and our speaker if we want to continue for a little bit longer. Um, do I? Nobody, nobody's bringing me lunch, so. Uh, we, <laughs> we only have one, one more question, really. Oh, good. Okay. okay. Good. Uh, Judy Thomas, your Stephen Breyer question. Uh, yeah, so uh, I Googled him and he's 82. And you know, one of my concerns would be with Trump having appointed three justices and that right now Biden's ratings are not very good and that Trump's ratings <laughs> apparently are better. Um, I'm, I, you know, should Stephen Breyer, do you think, resign so that, that um, at some point where it won't be a repeat of that Obama fiasco, uh, where, so that a liberal judge could be appointed? Oh, it's such a tough question because, you know, mm -hmm. Ruth Bader Ginsburg almost made it. Um, but, and so a lot of people were really angry that she didn't resign in time for the appointment of a, by a Democrat. Breyer is actually now 83. He had a birthday since your Google uh, <laughs> time. And he keeps kind of talking around it, but and he says he's still thinking about it. But the fact is, I think he's enjoying very much the fact that since Justice Ginsburg's death, he is the senior member of the liberal side. So when the few times that they can cobble together a majority, he is the one who decides who writes that opinion. And so I think he's really enjoying his role. He's in good health as far as we know. Um, so I'm torn on it. You know, there's a piece of me that says resign so we can make sure that we get someone in in case the, you know, the midterms are a disaster. Um, but on the other hand, it should be his decision. And, um, you know, this is their life. And uh, he, so I, one that doesn't, I wasn't critical of Justice Ginsburg uh, staying as long as she could. She continued to do good things until the end, despite an unbelievable medical record uh, history. Um, so, I think he has to make the decision. I hope that, I mean, the problem is that we have such a close margin in the Senate and they've got to get rid of the filibuster. It's just ridiculous. The filibuster is a rule. I mean, it's, a, you know, they've decided it internally. It's not a law, it's not. And it, it, they just need to get rid of that. And the Democrats being fearful that, well, then when the Republicans are in power, they'll use it. When Republicans are in power, they don't need to use it. They have Mitch McConnell. So um, I, you know, I think that um, I suspect he will retire at the end of this term, but that doesn't give a lot of time um, before the midterms, but then again, at the ballot, we the people, I'm hoping the midterms are going to break the history. And uh, despite the fact there's a lot of criticism for the president at the moment because of Afghanistan, uh, and now he's taken a very aggressive step in connection with COVID. I'm for one, I'm grateful that he's finally done that. I would have had him do it even sooner. And that's gonna get a lot of pushback, but that is definitely what has to happen for us to have a life back again. Um, so I don't know, uh, Breyer, every time they ke everybody keeps interviewing him and he keeps saying he's thinking about it. Um, and then he said in the mo most recent interview because he has a new book coming out, he said, you know, I'm not really very good at making decisions about myself. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, but, uh, you know, the court has become so 
clearly partisan. It's the first time that really the court, everyone on one side was appointed by one party, everybody on the other side was appointed by the other party. Um, <laughs> I had an email from a friend who is involved with a coalition of people who are very into voting. I don't want to say who it is because of what I'm going to say. <laughs> but she sent me an email and said they were talking about what about them sending a group, what about the group sending a letter to the justices? Do, do we think that that would help? And I'm going, <laughs> no, the justices aren't supposed to respond to public opinion. They're, they're looking at the law and they're supposed to be some kind of internal consistency about how they approach the law, which is what I'm going to deal with in this course this fall about, you know, how do they think we're going to look at their dissents and other things to see what, how they are approaching the law. But that the fact that that question was even asked suggests that people see the court as, you know, one more place where we have to persuade people to do what we want, uh, as opposed to an apolitical, a ideological court. Yes, but I'm gonna jump in here, um, Jane. Um, that's the way the court is supposed to operate, but it has not operated, at least from the citizen's viewpoint, for a long time like that, based on the fact that it has become very partisan. Is there a mechanism that can be initiated somewhere in government that will um, direct somehow the appointment of middle of the road justices going forward? No, there isn't really. But one thing that might come out of this commission, which I think would be a really good move, the Supreme Court is the only judicial level that has no ethical standards written, no code of ethics. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> so when, when a justice decides to recuse him or herself, it's up to them. For example, Thomas had, has participated in some decisions that his wife is actively on the advocacy side of. Oh. Um, several of them have go to the Federalist Society and make big speeches that are incredibly I mean, all of them get invitations to speak, but they go and you know speak about things that are in the pipeline and what their views are. So it would be really good if they had a code of ethics that they could apply. The problem is who applies it to them? You know, they're at the top of the stack, but that would be a really important move. Another suggestion is that somehow this has come in connection with adding, but have some of the circuit court judges kind of rotate onto a position and off so that you get different, uh, different people in there. You're not so locked into the six that, and three that are there now. So there are some, those kinds of things that are being suggested, Suzanne, but there isn't any right now. There's no mechanism they're self-regulated. There's no mechanism to, you know, say, uh, you know, hey, you shouldn't do that. You, you know, and. Um, well, here's a related oh my God. question. And, and let's make this the last question, yep. okay, Suzanne? And yep. the related question is, what do you think about term limits? For what do Supreme I think Court? about what? Term limits. Mm -hmm. Oh, term limits. Court. Yeah, I, I just like to add, I mean, my point is they keep, naming younger and younger and sometimes even less experienced judges sometimes. to the Supreme Court. And there's no limit that some of them will be on the court for 40 or 50 years. Couldn't we think about after a 25 year term, it's time for them to hang up their boots. Mm -hmm. Term limits, again, I'm sure is something that the commission is going to come out with some kind of recommendation. The problem is, again, that you would need a constitutional amendment. The Constitution gives them life appointment. That's right. And, um, you know, I think what would really be good is if you had them um, 
if you had a rule in place that said they had to go to uh, what is the status? There's a status of the justices that and the judges when they're not active, but they still can be pulled in for some arguments, etc. That at a certain age they have to go into that status, and then that is a, an opening. And what that would do is that they don't know when they make that rule who is going to be president when that comes for them, because and so that would be a way of not having them game the system to make sure that when they stop, they the right person is in the office of presidency so they can fill it again. Um, you know, Arkansas tried uh, past term limits for their uh, representatives for their Congress, uh, for both the Senate and the uh, House of Representatives. And there was a case, of course, it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court struck it down as unconstitutional uh, because again, the constitution determines the six year term for the senators and the two year for every representative. It's a great idea that the question is how to implement it. Um, I'm sure that will come out of the commission as a recommendation. I just don't know in what form. Uh, the whole business of having to appointing someone, having a vacancy occur when it's close to an election. And therefore, you know, the whole thing that Mitch McConnell did for when Obama, when they wouldn't hear Merrick Garland and even give him a, a, a you know, even bring him up to the committees um, is ridiculous because then it meant that we had a eight person court for almost a year and a half. Right. And, um, Amy Coney Barrett was nominated and um, approved and sworn in in a matter of days. Right. And she actually took her, was sworn in on a day where the voting was already taking place in some areas that had early voting. So, you know, the rules are great, it, especially if both sides agree to them and then follow them. But when right. There's, you know, there's, I want to say no moral turpitude for some of these people, but at any rate. Uh, no, I uh, agree with you. No moral turpitude. You're absolutely <laughs> correct. Well, uh, we are, we have been delighted and personally severely depressed by your comments, Jane, but we've <laughs> given us a lot to think about for sure. Um, on behalf of the league, I, I want to thank you tremendously for your time and your knowledge and your um, thoughts that we can take forward and hopefully turn into some kind of really um, driving action going forward this year. And for all of you that are have been with us, thank you so much for joining in. And as you can see, we've learned way more than we know what to do with, but hopefully we'll be very creative in the coming months. I wish I could have been more upbeat, um, but again, I'm really, I think your organization is superb and um, invite me back. I'll come anytime. Oh, great. Thank, Thank you. you so, so much. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice day, everybody. Take care. Yes.